1962, the scarlet ibis was pronounced the national bird of Trinidad and Tobago. By 1987, the species was protected by law. Each year, thousands of scarlet ibises fly abroad to Venezuela to nest for four months and return with their young ones. There are some 10,000 scarlet ibises in this country right now. However, if poaching continues in the swamps, we may gradually lose our national bird forever. Let's visit them. A dusky evening, we glide along a leafy doorway, opening into a silvery sheet of enclosed lake. A hush, wait, here they swoop. The boat has allowed only 200 yards of them. Almost a miracle, a vision of a tree in a flash covered with bright fruit. This is where the scarlet iris comes into roost for the night. They have three different roosting areas in the Kearney Swamp. This is the main roosting area where the birds come in. The others are situated where the boats cannot go. The penalty for poaching, six months in prison, $5,000 fine, gun, boat, and engine seized. Yet Nanan says cases are thrown out and treated lightly, and it continues. The birds leave the swamp to go to Venezuela to breed during the months of March to October. They do so because two poachers hunting of the birds, they used to breed in a Kearney swamp between that same time. But two of the hunting and shooting of the birds for the flesh, they now leave and go to Venezuela to breed between that same time. Why? The Third World War from Forestry Department. Few resources. It's easy. Every year on Christmas time, they have people doing a bird count in the swamp here. And if, if in case this year they do a bird count and they find about 6,000 or 7,000 ibis, and after a while you find them getting scarce and scarce, you must know that people hunting the ibis. What do they do with it? Well, ibis is good to eat. It was legal to hunt a long time. but. Now that it's a national bird, it doesn't hunt them anymore. It's not supposed to really, but people still do. The area is quite extensive with uh, access from numerous points and they don't have the manpower, the amount of boats and engines and officers to patrol this area effectively. If we are not careful one evening, these scarlet wings beating down on the mangrove swamp will be no more. In captivity, the ibis lose their scarlet color, which fades into a dull pink. This color change is attributed to its diet, especially of certain pigments, which are found only in the mud flats of the swamp. Our national bird. The juveniles or the younger ones are dark over the back with white underparts, changing its plumage to pink between six to 12 months. And they take well over three years to get their brilliant scarlet color. The adult ibis is about 23 inches in length and brilliant scarlet color. A bird of the new world. It lives along the coastline of South America, from Brazil to Colombia. It originates from the Orinoco Delta area, but remained with us even after we separated from the mainland. Unbelievably, the birds were once just game. Then came restrictions. Five birds per day per gun uh, were uh, instructed. And from 1950 to 1962, most hunters hunted within that uh, framework. And the Nanan family plays a large part in their survival here. Winston Nanan continues his father Udip's work, begun so many years before. He was successful in getting the government to establish the first sanctuary in Kearney. This uh, entailed a parcel of land within the Kearney swamp of about one square mile, and this land area was set aside for the roosting and the nesting of the scarlet ibis, and it was prohibited for, for hunters or anybody to get into that area. And Udip, a fisherman, started his life work and passed it on to his son and grandsons. He's no longer here, but I uh, take on, uh, carry on his work. Why do they live here? The mixture of fresh and salt water creates a blackish water living conditions difficult for most species, except for a few special ones like the scarlet ibis. It is obvious that the first step towards protecting the scarlet ibis is stricter laws against poaching. The second, a need to find resources to guard the swamp more comprehensively. In next week's special report, a look at the Karani swamp and other wildlife in it. 
Ira Mathur, TV6 News, with a special report. It is beautiful. They told me that we were coming to a bird sanctuary, but I never thought about seeing anything quite as spectacular as this. Uh, I really didn't know what we were getting into, but it was certainly worth it. It is necessary. It is part of the lungs of our nation, providing um, oxygen, because the, the transpiration rate for providing water, water vapor, um, for causing oxygen to renew the, the carbon dioxide in the air is tremendous in mangrove swamps. And it is a valuable resource. Some 20,000 tourists visit each year and pay anything from 20 US to 60 US each, which means it has an earning capacity of up to 500,000 US dollars per year. The swamp is state land managed by the forest division and Mr. Nanan and Mr. Ramsa hired two, two operators working for a number of years in the swamp and they uh, receive permission, they, they obtain permits to enter and to conduct their trade. But there are no money transactions, no money is ever obtained from the users of the swamp, and none of that is ever plowed back into the swamp. And it is being blasted from all sides. Rubbish from the Beetham dump, chemicals from industries, silt from the northern range, sewage pollution, poaching of the scarlet ibis and ducks, overfishing, over 160 species of birds and hundreds of species of fish and wildlife live off it. Since 1986, it has been declared a prohibited area, but most threats come from outside it. The mangrove is a mother of the swamp and provider of food, shelter and air to man, birds, animals and fish, and it's being killed. Literally, the northern range is moving into the Karani swamp. The, the volumes of silt that comes on every year. The mangroves protect us from hurricanes. In Puerto Rico, for instance, where mangroves were cut down, serious storm damage was done to areas inland. So mangroves do act as a protective function. In the Karani, when Hurricane Hugo um, passed through the region, we noticed the impact that the mangroves withstood because the trees were, in some parts, flattened because of the impact of the storm. The oysters and seafood you love to eat are bred here. The raw sewage sometimes is discharged into the waterways of the of the Karani River, uh, end up into the food chains, the fish and, and crabs, um, which humans consume, which can cause um, serious disease problems. We know that hepatitis um, B and other other um, pathogens can, you know, be eaten through the food chain. The fisheries are supported here. The fisheries offshore depend on the energy input from mangroves so that uh, without that conversion of natural sunlight energy into plant food which is consumed by animals and then consumed by other animals you won't have a fisheries existing we feed off the swamp in which pollutants from industrial estates in the east-west corridor agrochemicals are dumped here's what you eat we've got heavy metals like mercury and lead, which ends up in the food chains, um, into the fish that we eat, into the, um, the, the food that the birds feed on. We, we're likely to get species that will probably produce um, offspring that are unable to survive, maimed or deformed in some way. There is hope. There are plans to make Karani Swamp into a national park with the help of an IDB loan to this government. This means that tour operators will be made to plow back profits to the swamp. A minimal fee will be charged at the gate. A fee for cooking, camping, touring and fishing facilities will be charged, which means that funds will be made available for the swamp's protection and research. And laws will be passed to ensure that industries clean up pollutants before discharging them. Heaven forbid that, you know, we'd lose our swamp. Heaven forbid.